A 63-year-old woman arrived home to find her daughter and her boyfriend, both minors, locked in a room. Surprised and angered, she confronted them about their behavior. What no one could have imagined was that this argument would escalate into a violent fight between the couple and the mother, resulting in a scenario akin to the most horrific horror movie. Vilma Gabriela Niño de Guzmán de la Rosa was born in Peru in the late 1940s. She married José Tejada Ramírez, a man 21 years her senior. José had an older son from his first marriage. After they started living, he increasingly started distancing from his previous family, including his son. Vilma had a strong and reserved character. In contrast, she was a woman who reserved all her tenderness and dedication for the plants in her garden. Caring for them meticulously, talking to them and observing them daily was an activity that offered her unparalleled peace. When she finally felt the call of motherhood, it was not easy for her to fulfill her dream. Jose was over 70 years old while she had already passed her most fertile age. However, she was not one to give up easily. Thus, the couple decided to undergo fertility treatment. Finally, after a long struggle, at 49, Vilma received what she considered the best news of her life. She was pregnant. Later, when the couple learned they were expecting a girl, Jose felt tremendous joy. It seemed like a miracle, one he could never have imagined at his age. For her part, Vilma promised to be the best mother possible for the child. The little girl came into the world at the start of the new millennium, and they named her Stephanie. Healthy, rosy-cheeked, and cheerful, as the girl grew, she confirmed to her parents that the decision to have her had been the best. With her smile and vivacity, awakened in both a new energy and tenderness they had not known before. Over time, the girl proved to be very coquettish, feminine, and a fashion lover. Although the exact date is unknown, Jose suffered a stroke. While he survived, the aftermath was significant, as Jose was left disabled and was later diagnosed with senile dementia. Meanwhile, Vilma had to face raising her daughter alone. Her ambition was for Stephanie to become a righteous woman and, hopefully, a future doctor in medicine. However, as often happens, Stephanie's entry into puberty brought changes in her behavior. It was 2012 and suddenly, the once sweet and warm girl began showing signs of rebellion. As expected, this transformation also disrupted the mother-daughter relationship. Suddenly, that residence became the scene of constant confrontations that grew more frequent over time. Most of these fights occurred when Vilma forbade her daughter from going out with friends. For Stephanie, being locked up at home was tormenting, even perceiving it as a prison. In April of that same year, the young girl took an interest in another student from her high school named Fernando. He was a fairly calm boy, with many friends and no history of violence or rebellious behavior. When they met, it was love at first sight for him. Stephanie was not only a beautiful girl, but also confident and decisive. Thus, they quickly became a couple. At 15, Fernando felt on top of the world, capable of anything. But some time later, everything changed. By the end of 2012, the relationship between the teenagers was tumultuous, as evidenced by a letter that Stephanie wrote to him. In her own handwriting, the young girl boasted of knowing her own charms perfectly, making it clear that if he didn't measure up, she could easily replace him with another boy. Although Vilma learned of her daughter's relationship, she initially tried not to interfere. After all, she believed it was likely just a fleeting, insignificant romance typical of Stephanie's age. 
but months passed with no sign of the affair ending. Meanwhile, Stephanie took control of the relationship, knowing how to dominate Fernando. She liked to give orders and, of course, to be obeyed. When this did not happen, she punished him, scratching him, justifying it by saying he well deserved it. Far from leaving her or at least reacting, Fernando endured the situation, hopelessly in love, to the point of even setting aside his preferences, dignity, or social life. Because by then, the relationship also distanced him from his friends. Judging by some leaked text messages, the young man felt lost and, in essence, suffered greatly after each fight with his girlfriend. An example of this is an audio message Fernando sent to Stepani at 2 a.m. on January 6, 2013. Besides showing how insecure he was regarding her feelings, Fernando said some quite worrying things, talking about ending someone's life and seeking his girlfriend's support for these ideas. Although it was not clear to whom Fernando was referring, it was true that around that time Stephanie had started flirting with other young men. And of course, in the school environment, the news quickly spread. Upon hearing the rumors, Vilma opposed the relationship between her daughter and Fernando. This became the cause of countless fights. Refusing to obey her mother, Stephanie continued to see Fernando in secret. On Saturday, January 11, 2014, just before noon, the girl snuck her boyfriend into her house. They then went up to the second floor, to her room, where they locked themselves in to watch TV and later had an intimate encounter. When Fernando's father noticed his son's absence, suspecting he had returned to Stephanie, he began calling him on the phone. Distracted or perhaps anticipating his father's reproaches, Fernando did not answer. However, his father was not willing to give up, so he went to Stephanie's house to look for him. Once there, the man's shouts made Vilma come out of her room on the first floor. Although she ignored him and did not open the door, she immediately understood what was happening. Filled with anger, Vilma went upstairs and, without a word, broke into the room where her teenage daughter was with her boyfriend. It was at that moment that a fight broke out between the three, but it was an unequal struggle as Fernando soon managed to immobilize the woman. At that moment, Stephanie delivered a strong blow to her mother's head. The force was such that Vilma fell to the floor, dying. Immediately after, the teenager placed the body under her bed, then Fernando and she went to the bathroom to clean themselves. At 90 years old and with senile dementia, Jose heard nothing and was unaware of anything. After that, Fernando went home. Later that same day, Stephanie kept in touch with dozens of people through her social media accounts. She confessed she felt that her heart was at peace and that her problems had finally ended, expressing the pleasurable feelings she was experiencing without specifying the reason. From that moment, Stephanie moved into her mother's room, which was about 10 meters away from hers. Additionally, she took the savings Vilma had just over $10,000, and went on a shopping spree, spending as she pleased. 48 hours later, she posted a photo taken with her cell phone camera, in which she appeared wearing short floral pants and a pink blouse, holding a small puppy she had just bought in her right hand. She also paid for a change of style. As days passed, the teenager remained calm, even with her mother's decomposing body in the house. She continued to party with friends on several occasions. Jose, due to his health condition and advanced age, did not receive the care he needed from his daughter. When the smell from the second floor became unbearable, she and Fernando sprayed the room with various cleaning products and insecticides. They also partially covered the stained wall with black paint. Meanwhile, despite not being particularly friendly with them, the neighbors noticed that Vilma had not been seen watering the plants in her garden for a while. On January 16th, Stephanie called Fernando to tell him that three people were going to help her take out her mother's remains. 
According to his later testimony, Fernando suddenly felt a great repulsion towards his girlfriend, almost as if for the first time he fully understood what kind of person she was. He then decided to end their relationship. Although he no longer communicated with her or saw her, Stephanie tried to contact him in any way possible. Realizing that her text messages and calls were not being answered, the miner spoke with Marco, a cousin of Fernando's, and through him, she sent messages via one of her social media accounts. There, with encrypted messages, she asked him not to do anything foolish and not to say anything about what had happened. By that time, Vilma's loved ones had tried to contact her without success. Every time they asked Stephanie, she gave some excuse. After some time, they stopped believing her explanations and began to suspect that something had happened to her. In early March 2014, Vilma's relatives reported her strange disappearance to the authorities. Consequently, on the night of Sunday, March 9th of that year, the police arrived at the house with them. When they did not receive a satisfactory response from Stephanie about her mother's prolonged absence, the officers broke into the property with the family's authorization. Once inside, they found Stephanie nervously giving them the runaround in an attempt to hinder the authorities' progress. But the young woman's efforts were in vain, as the strong smell and the flies buzzing all over the place only heightened the police's worst fears. Upon turning the key to the room, the macabre scene was revealed in a matter of seconds. For 57 days, Vilma's body had been there, in the room of the daughter. Forensic experts at the scene found a knife, which was taken for analysis to determine if it had been used to kill Vilma. The authorities immediately considered Stephanie the main suspect in the crime. However, in her version of events, she tried to absolve herself of any responsibility and accused Fernando. Within minutes, reporters swarmed the surroundings of the house. The head of the Criminal Investigation Division informed the press of what was known so far, based on the minor statements. Thus, both the motive and the cause of Vilma's death were still under investigation. The 65-year-old woman's body was transferred for forensic examinations. Meanwhile, news cameras managed to enter the house and obtained images of the teenager's room. There, marks on the floor were still visible, despite the presence of several bottles of different elements, presumably used to erase them. It wasn't until the following day, Monday, March 10, 2014, that the police formalized the request to initiate a process for violation of criminal law for the crimes committed by the 14-year-old minor. Consequently, Stephanie was forced to remain in a juvenile center for the duration of the process. In the early hours of Tuesday, amidst the tumult of reporters and neighbors, agents transferred Stephanie as some of those present shouted accusations at her. Due to her status as a minor, she wore her face semi-hidden with a cap. Nevertheless, she took advantage of the cameras and microphones to defend herself. During the police interrogation, Stephanie added more details to her version of events. This time, she said that her mother became enraged upon discovering her with her boyfriend and then hit her with an iron bar. At that moment, Fernando came to her defense and attacked Vilma, injuring her in the left eye. They struggled, and then he pulled out a knife. She took the blade from him and tried to attack him, but he crawled away and with another blunt object, hit Vilma three more times in the head. The story continued with Stephanie going to the bathroom to clean the wound her own mother had inflicted on her. By that time, Vilma was already showing no signs of life, and Fernando also approached the sink to wash off the traces of the crime they had just committed. In conclusion, Stephanie only admitted to hiding the body. A few hours later, after being summoned by the authorities, Fernando appeared at the police station to give his testimony. He arrived accompanied by his father and his lawyer. The detectives heard from the young man that all responsibility for the crime lay exclusively with Stephanie. 
Furthermore, Fernando claimed that the girl was tired of the constant physical abuse she suffered at the hands of her mother. The boy recounted that the teenager used the same bar with which her mom had hit her several times. However, Fernando's version did not convince the police either, as he made serious contradictions during the interrogation. Consequently, the police decided that the young man should be held as the suspected co-author and accomplice of the homicide. It was up to the prosecution to decide whether to charge him. On the afternoon of March 12th, 60 days after the crime, Vilma's body was removed from the morgue and was taken directly to the cemetery, where she was buried in the presence of family and friends. One of the victim's nieces called for the maximum penalty for the two minors involved, adding that for teenagers, it seemed all too easy to kill without facing responsibilities. She also mentioned that Stephanie was very much loved by her mother and denied there was a bad relationship between them. Meanwhile, the prosecution's decision led to Fernando's arrest. The teenager was placed in a juvenile center. Experts concluded that he was a young man with a tendency towards introversion, easily influenced by a figure that generated emotional attachment. They also indicated that Fernando submitted to his partner's wishes, allowing himself to be manipulated to satisfy her desires, showing himself submissive and compliant out of fear of emotional abandonment. Regarding Stephanie, forensic psychologists saw that the young woman had psychopathological traits in her personality. Amidst the twists and turns of the case, a television report revealed that Stephanie had been influenced by another girl who was in prison for killing her mother after a heated argument on March 5, 2005. It was also stated that Stephanie stored poems of her on a tablet or personal computer. At the end of March that same year, Stephanie insisted on her innocence through a letter. There, she explained that when she misbehaved and did not obey her mother, she was hit with a towel or a notebook, but not with an iron bar. An unexpected twist was her portrayal of Fernando, whom she accused of mistreatment and threats, even against his father. The reason was simple. He was obsessed with her and aimed to socially isolate her. Lastly, she assured that she loved and respected her mother and was overwhelmed with sadness from missing her father so much. In this story, Jose too was a victim of circumstances, even though he was unaware of what was happening around him. The elderly man was left at the mercy of Vilma's family. When the firstborn finally learned of the crime and traveled from Brazil, he found that Vilma's family refused to let him see his own father. After turning to the authorities, Jose's son was finally able to rescue him. He found his father in a state of neglect and uncleanliness, and they were unable to find his documents anywhere in the house. Consequently, his lawyer reiterated his request for the relevant agency to expedite the delivery of this documentation. Without it, neither Jose nor his son could claim his pension. The entire country remained attentive to any new detail, even those concerning the daily life of the main suspect. Once transferred to a new center, Stephanie made headlines again when it was revealed that she shared a third-year classroom with another minor accused of a similar crime, Rosalinda. Her case was also highly publicized in Peru. The young girl, who had suffered excessive abuse at the hands of her mother, retaliated against her and took her life. The director of the juvenile center told a Peruvian TV program that the two girls had no problems adapting to the group and also showed acceptable performance. According to her, as part of her job, it was not her place to judge them. Instead, it was necessary to do everything possible as a system to reintegrate them into society. The young women could be confined there until they turned 20 as Peruvian law only imposes a maximum of six years of readaptation in juvenile centers for crimes committed by minors. For adults, 
The country's legislation imposes up to 35 years of effective imprisonment for those responsible for these crimes. On the night of Thursday, April 10, 2014, the crime reconstruction took place. During this, the young woman smiled, made victory gestures, and showed no remorse. Fernando also participated, but, unlike Stephanie, chose not to speak to the press and preferred to hide his face, wearing a bulletproof vest at all times. Both arrived from their respective juvenile centers and had no contact with each other during the procedure. However, coldly and without showing regret, they attacked and accused each other. Upon leaving the scene, Stephanie began to play with her hair as the cameras from photographers and television stations focused on her. Meanwhile, Fernando's defense argued that the accusation against their client was full of contradictions. The psychological assessment of the crime scene, conducted by experts, found evidence of cruelty, planning, and simulation of the events, including the use of air fresheners and wall paint to hide blood traces. Days later, Jose visited his daughter for the first time. Still coming to terms with the events and remembering little, he hoped Stephanie would tell him everything. After leaving, following a two-hour visit, he mentioned that his daughter blamed her former boyfriend for the crime, insisting to him that she was incapable of such evil. Jose carried with him a gift from his daughter, a pink heart saying she loved him. In the second half of April 2014, Stephanie's situation worsened when investigations into her cell phone uncovered threatening messages she had sent Fernando. These texts were retrieved by the young man's family for use in court, aiming to prove that Stephanie had planned the crime. By the end of July 2014, the prosecution formally charged Stephanie as the perpetrator of her mother's murder, with Fernando deemed an accomplice to the crime. In both cases, the public ministry requested six years of detention in a juvenile center and a compensation payment of $1,300. The prosecution's conclusions were based on the autopsy report, psychological assessments, and the crime scene psychological appraisal. Exclusive footage of Fernando in court was captured by a television camera. Walter, Fernando's father, was outraged by the verdict, insisting that there was no evidence incriminating his son. He believed that the inability to absolve Stephanie led to Fernando being charged as an accomplice. Contrary to the father's hopes, in October 2014, Fernando was sentenced to four years and six months in prison, while Stephanie received a six-year sentence. After serving their sentences, Stephanie and Fernando were released, with no further updates on their lives made public. Yet, in Peru, the memory of this shocking story lingers, a story of a daughter whose miraculous birth filled her parents with joy, only to later become a figure far from the angel they had dreamt of spending their final years with. Once again, dear audience, I thank you for your company. If you haven't subscribed yet, I warmly invite you to do so and become part of this great community. This is Unreal True Crime. Until our next episode, good night.